words matter. In fact, last words matter. And so when a pastor preaches his last sermon at the church that he's at, he's going to say something that matters. A pastor preaches a sermon on Easter Sunday all about the resurrection of Christ. He connects the heart of Christ and what God so did in loving the world so passionately and personally to the hearts of people. A pastor preaches his last sermon at the last church that he's at on Pentecost Sunday, and he preaches a moving sermon about the work of the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit taking the grace of our God and pouring it lavishly into the hearts of people, and then people going out and and pouring that love into the hearts and lives of those they meet. Last sermon, a pastor is going to preach on what matters most because he hopes that the circumstances, well, heighten the attention of those who are listening and they remember. They remember what matters most. So what does Jesus preach about on his very last sermon? Our lesson for today is from Mark 12, and Mark 12 picks up on the last time that Jesus is ever in Solomon's temple or his church. I want you to listen about what Jesus preaches on in his last sermon, his last words, if you will. As I read it, listen to that, but more than that, I want you to think about what does it mean that Jesus takes up this topic with his last sermon at the temple? This is Mark chapter 12. We're going to begin reading at verse 41. Jesus sat down opposite the place where the offerings were put and watched the crowd putting their money into the temple treasury. Many rich people threw in large amounts. But a poor widow came and put in two very small copper coins worth only a few cents. Calling his disciples to him, Jesus said, Truly, I tell you, this poor widow has put more into the treasury than all the others. They gave out of their wealth, but she, out of her poverty, put in everything, all that she had to live on. This is the gospel of your Lord. Right before Jesus preaches his very last sermon in the temple to his disciples, he sits down. And he sits down opposite of the place where the temple treasury was. Situated there were the offering plates, if you were. But these were no small little wooden plates. These were large wooden boxes about this tall. And 13 of them were placed around the 13 colonnades in Solomon's temple. On top of each box was a huge bronze trumpet-shaped receptacle that people would throw their money into as they crowded and pushed past each other to get into the temple. What Mark records and what Jesus says is that on their way into the temple, many rich people threw in large amounts. You can picture it. You can hear it. Picture the sound of many, many coins pouring in against the bronze metal. It's like rain pouring on a tin roof on a summer day. And then you hear it. It's almost an echo, empty hollow sound. Tink, tink. Tink, tink, tink. She wasn't really noticed by anybody. She wouldn't have been. No one would have paid her any attention. Only a few people actually did, those who were right next to the place where she deposited her offering. And they only noticed her because they heard. They turned and with smuggish looks said, that's it. Really? That's all you're giving? But how did Jesus know what she gave? Forget for a moment that Jesus is God, that he literally knows everything. He knew because he heard. 
They were designed so that you could hear what people were giving as the coins banged off the bronze receptacles. And so Jesus heard. And Jesus saw. But Jesus actually saw something that no one else saw. He saw her heart. If you think that Jesus was sitting down before his very last sermon in the temple and he was just people watching, think again. Jesus was looking past people. He was looking through people. He was looking straight into people's hearts. And this is why he brings his disciples over and he points her out and she praises what she has done. She had given everything. It was illogical. It did not make any sense. Whether it's a few small coins or much, much more, it, it, it's illogical. It doesn't make any sense to give all that you had. Why would you do that? Won't people have to take care of you and support you if you give everything you have? Shouldn't you give in such a way where you take care of yourself, your needs first, before you give to God? I mean, what she did is so backwards. It's like taking a few food stamps and giving it to Jeff Bezos, the richest man in the world. What difference could it make? And yet this woman, she gave it all. A few small coins. In today's currency, it comes out to four quarters, just about. I looked up the McDonald's menu. You know what she could have bought? She could have bought a cookie and a few apple slices. And that's it. That's all this woman had. And yet, what does Jesus say about it? She put in everything. That is all she had to live on. She throws all four quarters in. And in doing so, she preaches a sermon. She preaches a sermon that is more compelling and more clear than any sermon that anyone, save for Jesus, could ever preach. She doesn't step back and think about taking care of herself first. She doesn't think to herself that, you know what, I volunteer all of my time sweeping the steps here at the temple. I don't need to actually give more and give of my finances. She doesn't look at what God's word says about a heart and about giving and think, you know what, I'm just going to justify my giving philosophy so that I can sleep at night. She just gives. And she gives it all because this widow understands that God doesn't want just part of our lives. He wants all of our lives. She understands that every good and perfect gift comes from above, comes from the heavenly father, James chapter 1. This lady understands that our lives are but a mist. They're here today and they vanish in an instant. James chapter four. This woman understands that God promised to send the Messiah and that everything, everything in her life would find its fulfillment in him. This woman got it. She understood that every day she's present pursuing and being about earthly possessions was another day she came closer to having nothing. And yet every day she spent being about heavenly possessions was another day she spent getting closer to gaining everything. So she gave it all. She entrusted her money to her church, but really she entrusted it all to God. And in that way, she entrusted everything to him, her next meal, her next day, her entire life. And in so doing, she sets a new standard for Christian living and for Christian giving. A hundred percent, a hundred percent trust in God. That's the sermon that the widow preached. But I didn't ask you what her sermon was. I asked you, what was Jesus' sermon? What was the last sermon that Jesus ever preached to his disciples in the church, in the temple? It's not about money. The subject matter that Jesus takes up is the same subject that the widow takes up. It's faith. It's trust it's your heart. What Jesus talks about with his last sermon, his last words are what matters most to him. It's your heart. 
Jesus is not concerned with the amount of money that you give from your wallet. He is, however, very, very concerned with the attitude with which you live and with which you give towards him in your heart. Jesus doesn't want your money, but he wants 100% of your heart. And that's why he preaches this sermon, a sermon about the heart. Money was just the occasion and the application and the illustration. So that's where we'll start. Because here's the truth. How your hand gives is a reflection about how your heart lives in relation to God. How your hand gives is a reflection of how your heart gives and lives in relation to God. So where are you at? Where are you at in the way that you think about money and think about giving it to God? Let's just talk about the elephant in the room for a moment. The reality is most Americans and most Christian Americans are very, very shy about talking about money. But God isn't. God is not shy about talking about money. In fact, did you know that for every one time that God talks about sex and romance in the Bible, pretty important topics to talk about, for every one time he talks about sex and romance, he talks about money and using money 10 times? Oftentimes, good, well-meaning, godly Christians will say, it is not the church's place to talk about money. But did you know that in God's word, God talks about money over 2,300 times? And so, if God's church talks about God's word, it seems logical that God's church is perhaps the safest and maybe even the most equipped place to talk about money. So let's unpack this idea. Let's unpack this idea that how your hand gives is a reflection of how your heart lives with God. What it comes back to and what this really is all about is one of the biblical principles that God and his word gives us about Christian giving and about Christian living. The widow exemplified it and the apostle Paul explained it in the lesson that we read earlier. In second, or excuse me, 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and 16, Paul talks about perhaps the most eloquent and beautiful chapter on the resurrection. And then he wraps it up by saying this, thanks be to God. He gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. He talks about why it all matters, why our Christian faith matters. And it's only because Jesus Christ lives and he has given us victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. And then he talks about what? What we're supposed to do with that why? Always give yourself fully to the work of the Lord because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. Jesus talks about why it is that we are to go about the Lord's work. He talks what we're supposed to do, be about the Lord's work. And then he talks about this, how we're supposed to go about the Lord's work. Paul wraps it up by saying, now about the collection for the Lord's people. On the first day of every week, each of you should set aside a sum of money in keeping with your income. God explains proportionate giving only in the context of why we give, only in the context of what we give for, being about the Lord's work because the Lord was about working for us. That's the idea that's the idea that we're getting at when we talk about how your hand gives is a reflection of how your heart lives with God. But now can I show you what that looks like? Let's say that proportionately, I give one rung or 1% of everything that God has given me back to God. I live in trust. I live in thanks for God that he has given me life. He has given me victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. And this is how I show him thanks and praise. And if this is where you are, by the way, that's awesome. That's awesome, especially if you have never thought about giving, giving money to God as a way to worship him, to honor him, to thank him. Now, let's be honest. It wasn't that hard for me to step up here. In fact, it's really not that hard for me to be up here. And it's really not that hard 
if I fall from here, for me to catch myself and be quite all right. I don't need anyone to catch me. I don't need anyone to hold me up there. And yet, yes, I thank God, I trust God. But do I really in this way need him? How your hand gives is a reflection of how you heart, your heart lives with God. So let's say this. Let's say not one, but let's say you give three rungs, 3%, a portion of all you have to live on back to God. You live and you give here. If this is where you're at, this is awesome because it means that there's some intentionality happening here. You are planning, you are thinking about the fact that God has given you so much and this is how you are giving them back to him. But let me ask you this. If you are living and giving 3% back to God in recognition that everything comes from the Lord, how much does that impact your lifestyle? How much does that impact your faith. The reality is for most Americans and most Christians, including those who are here this morning, living and giving at 3% means that we are still able to afford everything that we need for life. In fact, we're still able to afford some things we don't even need for life things that we want. Now, I'm not trying to preach a sermon that you shouldn't have things that you want. That is all fine and well. What I'm asking is this. Is the way that we give and give thanksgiving to God, well, we keep back because our hearts are tied more closely to things that we want. Most Americans and most Christian Americans can live and give at 3% and still afford to go out to cool restaurants, to have nice and new things, to buy things for our kids, things that they, they really don't even need. We can still afford to live in such a way where we navigate a consumeristic culture and live where we don't look like we're in any way in want. And again, I am not talking about how it's wrong to buy, it's not wrong to buy things and gifts for your kids or to live and have things that you want that are nice and that are new. What I'm asking you to do this morning is stop and reflect on your heart. Is the way that we give and the way that we live finding more satisfaction in the savior of our money than it is in our Savior who died for us. So here's my prayer. Here's my prayer for all of you because God has been so, so good to us. God has been so generous to us. God has given us grace on top of grace. He has given us so much in his Son that he even gives us blessings in this life. He gives us an income that can afford everything that we need and even things that we want. So my prayer for you Christians is this, that we pray, pray that by God's spirit, we're able to distinguish between needs and wants. We're able to distinguish in such a way where our hearts are not captivated by earthly wants, but are content wholly in the fact that God gives us everything that we need and more. Because by the way, the average Christian in America, you know where they give? It's right here at 3%. In fact, even less. It's at 2%, 2.5%. You know where Christians gave in America during the Great Depression? A whole percent more. It says something about the materialistic world we live in and how our hearts are drawn to that. So let's say you give more. Let's say you give one, two, three, four, five percent. 5% out of everything that God has given you in your life. How your hand gives is how your heart lives. And can you live with a healthy heart that gives to God in this way? 
Absolutely. You absolutely can. God says he loves a cheerful giver. In his gospel, Jesus himself says, where your treasure is there, your heart will also be. Yes, you can have a healthy heart, spiritually speaking, that trusts God and looks to God for all things as you are giving to him your income. So how do you know? How do you know that as you give and live, giving back a portion of 5% of everything you give to God, that your heart is trusting him 100%? there's some questions that you can ask yourself. When I give large amounts of money and at any proportion, 5% is a large amount, am I fearfully looking down about what I don't have? Or am I cheerfully looking up for the one who gives it to me? As I give and I live at this proportion, am I finding my identity in what I don't have? Or what I do have from Christ. How your hand gives is how your heart lives in relation to your faith, to your trust with God. Whenever Christians talk about giving, the question comes up, well, then how much should I give? God talks a lot about materialism in his word. He talks a lot about it because he knows that we live in a world, well, a world that runs on money. And he knows that that's going to be a thing that our hearts are drawn to. So God talks about it and he talks about it a lot, but every time he talks about it, none of the times are in a legalistic way. God never demands, God never commands that you give a certain amount. He says that you should first sit down at the beginning of your week or the beginning of the time where you receive money and give first fruits, a giving principle we'll talk about in another week. And then he said it should be in proportion to what your income is. And then finally, God says, I love a cheerful giver. I do not love a giver or I do not want gifts from people who give out of coercion or give out of a negative attitude that this is something they have to do. God is not legalistic. His motive is simply that you give at a heart that gives thanks and praise for all that you've been given in Christ. So naturally, New Testament believers still ask, okay, so, so how much should I give? Well, this church and the church body that we are a part of wholly rejects the notion that Christians must give a tithe, that they are commanded and demanded to give a tithe, which is in its simple sense, 10%, 10% of everything that you have to give. God never talks that way in scripture in the New Testament where he demands that. He only says, give out of a motive, motive, motivated heart that loves Christ. Give first fruits and give proportionately. All that being said, we also reject the idea that it's somehow wrong to talk about a tithe. It's somehow wrong to talk about giving 10% because the reality is God talks about that a lot. God knows that we live in a world that runs on money. He knows it's a thing that our hearts are always going to be turned towards and, and look towards to find salvation, to, to find identity. And so he talks about it a lot. He talks about giving and he talks about money in his word. And he also shows us. He also shows us what faithful hands do when they give. And he shows us how faithful hearts live who trust in God. And time and time again, you know what he shows us? Is that it's not just 5% or 8% and I'm not going above this to 10%. But every time that God points to a cheerful giver, he's always time and time again showing that it's someone who's giving a tithe. In fact, that is a starting point. In the Old Testament, Abraham gave a tithe. In the Old Testament, God commanded that God's people give to him a tithe. In fact, multiple tithes throughout the year. In the New Testament, he shows us examples of Zacchaeus, who gives 50% of everything that God had given him. And he shows us this widow, who gives 100% of everything that God has given her back to him. What's the point? What is the point I'm making with this? It's that when you give 10% and you give over and above what you think is logical, what you think is reasonable, what you think is safe, what it does is it not only demonstrates to you 
and to your God, the only one who can see your heart, that your heart is fully holy and trusting in him, it really actually, practically, concretely makes you have to trust in him. Standing up here, if I fall, I'm not good to catch myself. If I jump down from here, I will probably hurt myself. In fact, I need someone to catch me if I fall. I need someone stronger than me, bigger than me, more generously to support me and uphold me when I'm standing up here. And if I fall down here, but even if I'm sustaining and maintaining life up here, I need someone to watch over me, keep me safe, and provide for me in all that I do. I need to have a heart that relies wholly 100 percent on God. And that is the point that God is making in his word. That's the point that he's making in his last sermon that he preaches at the temple, that your heart matters to God and that God sees you. When you're living up there and really when you're living anywhere in between there or above there or below there, God sees you God sees you and he promises to uphold you and give you more than you could possibly ever give to him. Jesus says this in his word. He promises this in Matthew 6. He says, therefore, I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more than food, the body more than clothes? Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet our heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? If I'm taking care of sparrows, how much more am I going to take care of you? In the Old Testament, in Malachi 3, he promises, he challenges God's people, bring the whole tithe into the storehouse that there may be food in my house. Jesus says, God says, test me in this, says the Lord Almighty and see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessings that there will not be enough room to store it. And you say, come on, that's the Old Testament. Is he really gonna do that today? Jesus, in Luke chapter six, says this. He says, give and it will be given to you. A good measure, pressed down, shaken together and running over will be poured into your lap. For with the measure you use it, it will be measured to you. This is God's word. This is God's promise to you. A promise from a God who sees you and who cares about you. Look, I know some of you, and that's probably unfair, all of us on some levels, all of us, are living afraid because we believe that money can make us more happy than God. We believe that money can make us more happy than God. But when we live that way, when we live with fear surrounding finances instead of full confidence and trust surrounding God, the ironic thing is, is that we end up poor. We end up oppressed. We end up widowed and alone spiritually. We end up poor in our relationship to God. We end up poor and greedy in our relationship to others, in the way we steward the things that we have, in the way that we give to others to care for others. And we end up having things that, well, that poor widow didn't have to worry about. We have selfishness and greed. But she only knew freedom. She only knew the faithfulness of God. But we do have something that she has. We have a savior. You have a savior who sees you. You have a savior who sees you in the same way that he sees that widow. He looks right past you. He looks right through you. And he looks right to your heart. And you know what he sees? He sees everything. He sees the good, the bad, and the ugly. And yet he sees that. And yet he, just like he did for the widow, cares for you. He comes for you. And that is really, really good news for those of you who are spiritual widows, just like I am who have even less than, than two small coins to give to God. The good news is that Jesus came, he comes still, and he cares for you.
There's a reason why Jesus left his heavenly home and came here and was homeless. There's a reason why just two days, just two days after Jesus looked at the widow, he went to the cross and gave up everything he had, everything he had in this world and everything that he possessed in eternity, even gave up his relationship with his father. There's a reason why Jesus points to the widow. And it was because he was more widowed than she. And it was all because he wanted to give everything to me and to you. The reality is we have a God who cares. We have a God who sees us, who comes for us and cares for us. And he has given up everything for you. It is true that the way your hand gives is a reflection of how your heart lives with God. But here is an even truer statement. The way God's hands gave for you makes the reality of how your heart lives with God. The way God's hands were on a cross marks out for you the reality of how your heart lives with God forever. That's just the way it is. That is how things work with God. That's how it is with Jesus. I told you this, this sermon, this, this series, it's, today it's called A Place for Giving. But more than that, it's a place for receiving because that's how it works with Christ. You cannot give more to him or better to him than what he gives and gives to you still. It's a place for receiving. That's how it works with Christ. You give him your sins, you receive forgiveness. You give him your death, you receive life. You give him all of your fears, you give him all of your worries, and he gives you hope and he gives you peace. You give him your entire life and he gives you nothing less than God and everything is yours in Christ Jesus. That's how it is with Christ. So go all in. Go all in because here is the beautiful, wonderful truth. Your savior, your God, he... He's never let down a widow and he's not about to start. This, my prayer for you and for this place is that it is a pray, place for giving, yes, <laughs> but a place for receiving, a place for seeing that Jesus sees you. Amen.